So with no further ado, I think I start uh, with introducing our first speaker, who is our dear friend Peter Sloth. Uh, Peter Sloth is director of the newly um, established Institute of Advanced Study Amsterdam, and he is also co-director of the Complexity Institute at NTU Singapore. Um, Peter is famous for large-scale computational experiments uh, in medicine and social systems. We are very happy to have you here. Please take the stage, Peter. Okay, so um, I, I understand from Stefan that it has to be short, 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 short. So I thought I'd just show you some nice pictures. Um, and, and then we'll just see what, what, it, what it brings us. This is uh, actually a picture uh, very close to where I live. Um, it's, uh, it's the dunes, like, you know, in between the sea and the, and the, and the city. It's a, it's a lovely place to be at. Um, in Singapore. And it's not in Singapore, actually. <laughs> it's in the Netherlands. Uh, in Singapore, you will see only high risers. But uh, yeah, so, um, and this is uh, kind of an artist impression of the same thing. Um, not the kind of art I think we get this evening, but um, it is an artist impression. You see all the nice things that are happening there. And, um, and, and this is what happened over the last 350 years, trying to make sense of all these things that we see um, around us, all the way from the, uh, let me see if this works, all the way from the, uh, uh, you know, from Newton, from the, the field equations of Einstein, uh, of course, uh, there, there's, there's Maxwell here, there is the, the photosynthesis, uh, famous uh, Schrodinger. And what this actually shows is, you know, we have had 350 years of absolutely lovely and very deep, deep science that allows us to understand all these different bits and pieces. Um, but now it's time to actually understand how these things connect together. And I think that's what complexity science to some extent is about. How are these things connected? How are they related? And can we find um, patterns that kind of connect them. So, but we're not the first one to ask this. This is, uh, this is from uh, about 500 years BC, um, where um, the Chinese philosophers, if you like, were already saying things like, look at the tree, the mountain, or the foam on the water, when it hits the shoreline, all amazingly beautiful, and all kinds of wild and crazy patterns. They were talking about uh, Li, the organic pattern that creates order from, uh, from chaos. And uh, I think, when, when I think about complexity science, it's you know, about this, pro what are these processes that create this order, these kind of dissipative structures that we find around us, like ourselves. And um, what this has been going on is thinking about how, what are these patterns that connect things together. And I think a lovely quote here from Richard Feynman uh, inspires us all. It says, nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns, so each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Now the question then is, okay, what are these, you know, these, um, these, these long threads, what do they look like? And, um, and it really depends on where you're coming from and from which angle you look at it, and I, I guess complexity science can help us to unravel, unravel that uh, tapestry without completely destroying it. Um, so, what are these patterns that we're talking about? Um, what are they doing? Well, if you think about you know, your brain, if you think about the neurons that are firing constantly now, uh, well, some of you are, might be asleep still, like myself, but you know, there are still neurons firing there. Um, and then you can ask yourself the question, okay, you know, this create patterns, these patterns we might think of like being thoughts, um, but then you know, how much of a thought is there in one neuron? There is, probably not much of a thought, okay, then I add 10,000 neurons, and how much of a thought is in 10, and then I can go on, at what point do I actually get a thought? And this, this, this kind of aggregational, this hierarchical thinking about um, the emerging of these properties that we feel like define complexity uh, is still very much an open thing. And so the question is, can we come up with structures, can we come up with theory, with methods to reason about this scale of things? And um, and if you think about that, uh, you know, you think about how these emerging patterns, how they come about and how they actually stay about, um, you, you wonder, you know, how, how, how can it be that I'm still, and that you are still sitting here, where at the same time we know that about every year, 96% of all your atoms are being replaced. So all the atoms in your body are being replaced, about 96% of them, every year. And somehow you, you know, you almost look the same the next morning. <laughs> Almost, I say. You know, you're getting older, so something, there's something happening there. But yeah, so there is some kind of you know, memory in the system, some kind of structure in the system, some kind of storage of, of information, if you like, in the system. And the question is, what is that? What is that thing that, that is keeping us alive, so to say, and that's keeping us whole? 
So um, this, 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 I, I say that you know, the bits and bytes in your body calculate and maintain its structural integrity. That's another way of looking at it. So the structural integrity, the fact that you still exist in the next morning, uh, more or less looking like you looked the day before, um, is because of this probably. So um, what we're looking for is if this is, you know, if this is coming from the way we share information is stored in our, in our body, if information is stored in, in, in the patterns of life, then what are these, what, how is it stored, how is it carried around? Well, of course, there's been a huge amount of research in complexity science on, on networks. And maybe the networks might be the structure that actually store that information that nature needs to carry on. And here there are some three examples of the work that we've been doing ourselves. One is on this is on the on, on the on, on the protein level um, between the proteins of the HIV virus and uh, the proteins in your immune system. Uh, this is on the on the sexual network level, uh, and this is on actually crime network level. The reason why I show this is that you know all the way from the molecule to the social interactions, we now know that that networks carry that information, store that information. But that's not enough. Um, the question is then still, why are the networks there? And I don't think there's a real good answer for it at this point in time. Is it just you know, an, an, an imagination of, our, uh, of ourselves, or are they really there, to so to say? So um, what well, we discovered, the two things that I'd like to share with you that, that I think, I'm almost done, don't worry. <laughs> two things that I think are um, uh, relevant here that we discovered, one is that um, in, in those complex networks, we actually see a thing which is called stochastic resonance. And that means that if you have a little bit of noise in a network, so you have a network that does something, you know, it keeps you alive, it's a protein network or it's a social network, whatever, and it, it keeps the thing going. And if you disturb it, if you somehow create some noise, if you create uncertainties in the connections in the way the information propagates, then actually the process gets better. The way the information is progressed through the network gets better with a little bit of noise. If you add too much noise, it will collapse. Um, and so that, and, you know, and there's another effect, which is the effect that actually the, the, um, the, the majority of the information transfer takes place not in the hubs and not in the remote parts, but takes place in what we call the man in the street, kind of in between. Now, if these two, these two things might be the reason why nature invented networks in the first place. Because this resilience, this, this gives you resilience to noise, this gives you resilience to errors, this gives you resilience to mutations in your protein networks, for instance. So it might be that this might just be an evolutionary thing, but it might just that evolution to some extent uh, came up with the idea, if you like, um, of, of, of networks storing the information that, that, that keeps the things going. So that is a, a way to look at it. So I want to make one small, well actually one big leap of faith. Um, if, if this is the case, if this is the case that nature stores its structure, its information in, in, in structural things like networks, then uh, we should not talk about um, you know, uh, proteins as such, and we shouldn't talk about maybe social things as such, but we should talk about information. We should talk about information because that is the overarching concept that connects um, you know, the, the low-level molecules to the high-level interactions that we have among ourselves. And so... Um, uh, that's what we actually do. And then what we, if we do that, we can actually build on top of this, you know, these, these, these brilliant minds that actually, of which I showed you some of the equations in the first slide, um, that went all the way from you know, a, a macroscopic description to a microscopic description uh, of nature. And um, if you just put these guys together, you know, we get this fellow, Shannon, actually helping out in describing how information is stored in those networks um, at large. So, um, <clears throat> this is almost the last slide, then the, the thing is that, okay, that information, where does it come from, right? So one way to look at it is it comes from the sun, because basically the sun gives us, it fills the biosphere with uh, Kips free energy, and the Kips free energy is just equivalent to, uh, to the entropy, is equivalent to information. So to some extent, you can just say that the sun gives us information, and that information is stored in structures, that uh, actually keep us alive. So that's what this, I said, I see, I'll show you some nice pictures. I thought this is a nice one. Um, that keeps us alive. So this is the information coming from the sun and that's stored in the structures that we, that we all observe. So I think the, the conclusion um, I want to bring to you is that one way to, that we might want, I mean, this is of course a hypothesis. We have to prove, we have to make steps to really make this, to substantiate these ideas. 
Um, I guess that could be some uh, goal of the um, complexity hub to, to look into these questions. But the hypothesis then would be that life arises from the transformation of this KIP3 energy into structures that use networks to register, share, and process information. And all the while, life is computing its own future. It's like, you know, these 356 days that you stay alive over the year, even though your 96% of your atoms are being replaced all the time. And so the question is, okay, if, that's, if that is so, then what's the point of it? Why is life doing that? I have no idea, but I guess it's just for fun. Thank you.